Hi friends, how are you today? I hope you're having a wonderful day so far. And if you're not having a wonderful day, don't worry. It's gonna get better. I'm rooting for you. My name is Bailey Sarian, and today is Monday, which means it's Murder, Mystery, and Makeup Monday. Shana 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 if you are new here, hello, how are you? My name is Bailey Sarian, and on Mondays I sit down and I talk about a true crime story that's been heavy on my <coughs> noggin, and I do my makeup at the same time. If you're interested in true crime and you like makeup, I would highly suggest you hit that subscribe button because I'm here for you on Mondays. Mm. I think this might be my 100th episode. Should we celebrate? I don't Yay! <coughs> Okay, that was it, thank you. I can't believe we made it. I definitely surpassed 100 by now because I've deleted videos along the way. You know, like the older ones were super sloppy or I just had wrong information. I was like, I cannot keep this up, deleted those. It feels like way more than 100. I thought I was on like 200 by now, whatever. Okay, cool, I'm so glad we're here. <laughs> Thank you for hanging out with me and subscribing and watching and liking, commenting. It really means more than you know and I hope you know that and I just really appreciate you guys and this little community we built together. I just, I love it. I love it a lot, thank you. So before we jump into today's story, we do have a sponsor. HelloFresh. HelloFresh, if you don't know, well, you can get mouthwatering seasonal recipes and uh, fresh pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door with HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. With HelloFresh, they make cooking at home fun, easy, and affordable. As the temperatures are rising and we're melting, <laughs> HelloFresh knows people are looking for more ways to avoid the hot ass oven. Mm hmm So this year they're launching some summer only limited time recipes and specials. Yay. Not only that, they also offer different options like low calorie, uh, carb smart, vegetarian, and more if you're looking to maintain your current diet or you have a specific diet need. HelloFresh has got you covered. Every recipe is packed with fresh produce sourced directly from farmers. And with HelloFresh, you can skip the trip to the grocery store and have everything you need to make chef curated meals delivered right to your door. Also, the packaging HelloFresh uses to ship your food is almost entirely made from recyclable and slash or already recycled content. Yesterday, I made the spicy chicken barbecue meal thing. Oh my God, it was delicious. I accidentally burned the carrots though, which, you know, whoops, sorry about that. But I still ate them because honestly, I like my food to be a little crunchy, kind of burnt, I don't mind. Like don't give me the soggy fries and stuff. I like my shit like kind of burnt. Sorry, HelloFresh, I didn't mean to burn the carrots. I just, something's always gotta burn if I'm making it. I look forward to making something with HelloFresh because they constantly have us trying new delicious recipes and they're so freaking easy to make. If HelloFresh sounds like your cup of tea, then hop on over to hellofresh.com and use my code BAILEYSARIAN14 to get 14 free meals, including free shipping. Again, that's hellofresh.com and use my code BAILEYSARIAN14 to get 14 free meals, including free shipping. I just wanna say a big thank you to HelloFresh for partnering with me throughout the, these years. Honestly, it's been so great. I really appreciate them and um, their delicious meals and for working with me. I'm so grateful. But a big thank you to you guys because without you, I wouldn't be here right now. And that's a fact. Disclaimer time. Warning, today's video contains graphic descriptions of crime scenes, adult dialogue, and strong language. Viewer discretion is advised. If you're ever curious to know what I'm using, I will list it down in the description box down below. But other than that, I will stop yip yapping. And let's talk about Louise. Okay, Louise. She was born September 30th, 1880. But the crazy ones were in like the 1800s, early 1900s. I don't know what it was. Something was in the water. She was born in uh, Bienville, Louisiana, did I say that right? I probably did that, Bienville, Louisiana, okay? And her father was super wealthy. Oh yes, very wealthy man. He ran a newspaper company and honestly, it was very clear to Louise that she came from a very privileged life. At the age of 15, she would go on to attend a private school in New Orleans, 
New Orleans. Do you remember? A couple videos ago, I said New Orleans. I got roasted in the comments. I get it. So she goes to a private school, New Orleans. Um, but she wouldn't last there too long because she was expelled. She got caught stealing from her classmates. And then the final nail in the coffin was when she was caught engaging in some sexual behavior with other boys in the school, you know? So she got kicked the heck out. There was really not much information about her upbringing. Like I was trying to figure out where her mom was at and stuff. And again, cause it's such an old story. It's like, good luck. So some of the details are missing, but you'll get it. It's still a very interesting one. So she grows up very privileged family, wealthy, great. And then in 1903, Louise, she marries her husband, her first husband, and his name is Henry Bosley. And he worked as a traveling salesman. Louise seemed to like the fact that Henry was away all the time, you know, cause he's a tra traveling salesman. So he's like not home. And Louise liked that because while he was away, Louise did indeed play, if you know what I mean. She was having many affairs. It's not very nice, Louise. Anyway, so after four years of marriage, Henry comes home one day from working, he comes home early. He opens up the door and what does he find? Louise is inside with another man. He's absolutely devastated. Like he's heartbroken over this. And because he walked in on Louise, the love of his life cheating on him, he was, he fell into like a really deep depression, okay? And then soon after he ended up committing suicide. Yes, it's rough in the first five minutes, I know. After her husband's death, Louise decides to move to Shrevenport, Louisiana another part of Louisiana. So she moves and she's in need of a job, right? She's got bills to pay. She's new in town, great. So she starts looking around for a job and Louise figured the easiest job for her, I'm not saying this is an easy job, it, she felt like it was an easy job for her, was um, to become like a high class sex worker, but she could uh, make even more money, extra money on top of that by simply stealing some money from her clients when they weren't looking. So she would, you know, when they weren't, when they were like doing something else, she was sneaking off and like taking some money from them. And Louise, she pulled these tricks for about two years, but decided she was over it. And then in 1911, Louise moved to Boston where she wanted to change her name for some reason. She needed to rebrand and she changed her name to Louise M. Gold. <gasps> Oh my gosh, I messed up. Oh dear. Sometimes you mess up your eyeliner and that's okay. That's okay. I'm working with it, not against it. Okay, moving on. Louise, when she's in Boston, she gets a new scam going and she starts telling people that she's a 19 year old heiress from Dallas, Texas, who has been confined to a convent by her family and she had run away, she had escaped. I mean, there's no internet back then or anything, right? So it's like, yeah, sure, you are, whoa, you know? I know we don't know too much about her upbringing, but uh, we know that wasn't true. It was, it was fake. That was a lie. So Louise is kind of spinning this web of lies while mixing and mingling with the wealthier families of Boston. Now it's said that Louise was a very beautiful woman and she was very charming. It's not long before she manages to convince one of these wealthy families to take her in, like almost adult adopting her. Very bizarre, but okay. But it's also not long before Louise is up to her old tricks again, okay? She decided she was gonna start to scam the family. She would run up large bills at some of the most uh, expensive stores in Boston. And she was also stealing money, not only from the family she was staying with, but also their friends and their employees. This is like the olden days where you could be like, put it on the card, put it on the Johnson card account, you know, and it's like, you could just pay later or something. No one would let you do that now, but this, at this time, that was a thing. So she was doing that, like put it on the tab. And yeah, she was, she was running up a big bill, not having to pay anything. Now it's not clear how, but someone catches on to her lies and like what she's really been up to. Okay. So they tell the family that she's been staying with, Hey, she's lying to you. She doesn't come from a wealthy family. She's been stealing money and she's been running up a bill. 
I don't know, but I'm assuming it was something like that, you know? Well, again, this is the olden days, 1911 at the time, and the wealthy family she was staying with was super embarrassed that they were duped in the first place. Their first thought was if anybody finds out, they would suffer greatly from public embarrassment. Okay, and that's like the most important thing, public embarrassment. So they don't want that. Okay, so the family's like, we're not gonna press charges, but they tell Louise, if you go away, okay, if you promise to leave town, we won't uh, press any charges. And she's like, okay, promise? I mean, what a deal. No lessons to be learned there. Sounds great. So Louise goes to Waco, Texas, where she meets right away a wealthy oil boss named Joe Apple. Now, Joe loves Diamonds, oh yes. He has diamonds on everything. Rings, belt buckles, even the buttons on his shirt had diamonds on them. And he loved to flaunt his wealth to the peasants with their basic belts and shirts, you know? So he's just a douche, a rich douche. Well, Louise sees the diamonds and she's like, hell yeah, sign me up. She goes straight to him, beeline for that guy and I don't know, I don't know what her deal is, but she's able to get a man very easily. And things between Joe and Louise, they get pretty hot and heavy pretty damn quickly, okay? Um, but the relationship itself is pretty short-lived. One week after they met, Joe was found dead. His cause of death, he was shot. But not only that, all of his diamond jewelry was missing. Now, many had seen Joe and Louise together. So naturally, Louise was arrested. She was arrested for the crime and she went all the way to trial for the crime because it was believed she was the murderer. But again, people just really seemed to enjoy, just like Louise, I, I don't freaking know, man. She sat on the stand and told the jury that Joe had tried to rape her. So she killed him in self-defense. She had no diamonds in her possession, so the jury, they side with her, it was self-defense, and they find her not guilty, and she's released. Now, that's all fine and dandy, you know, because like that does happen, and self-defense is important, but as we go on in this story, you'll start to question if that's true or not, you know? So Louise decides that was a pretty close call. I mean, she went all the way to court, she almost got in trouble for murder. She needs to move again and rebrand herself because now people know her in town as, you know, this questionable woman. So in 1913, she picks up and she moves again. This time she goes to Dallas, Texas. Look, I don't know how she did it, but she did. She would find a rich guy on day one. It was literally weeks after being there, she meets and marries a man also named Henry. No, 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 his name's Harry. Sorry, his name's Harry. He works as a night clerk at a hotel called St. George. In the 1930s, St. George would get like a $100,000 makeover. It was a really big deal. And the hotel would be renamed as Hotel Whitmore. One night, Harry is working his, his night shift at the hotel when a robbery happened. There was $20,000 worth of jewels stolen out of the hotel's safe. He tells Louise, like, there's been a robbery. Like, all these these uh, jewels are missing. And Louise is like, oh my God, that's crazy. You know? And so the, he calls up the police and the police come and they interrogate Harry. But he's eventually cleared of any involvement with the missing jewelry because he doesn't have them. Investigators then look into Louise, right? Cause she's been hanging with Henry, like maybe something's up with her. So they look into her thinking maybe she did it. But at the end of the day, there was zero evidence linking her to the crime and none of them had the jewels in their possession. So well, it couldn't have been them. Now, sadly, even though they had both been cleared uh, by police, Harry allegedly wasn't able to like really move past the embarrassment of being accused of stealing from the hotel. And it was said he fell into a major deep depression, leading him to commit suicide. There's a lot of speculation that Harry did not actually commit suicide. Rumors were going around that Louise actually was the one who pulled the trigger. But again, there was no evidence to actually prove that this was true. So 
it was just all speculation and rumors. But ain't that a little fishy? That's three boyfriends who are dead. Hmm. So now Louise is done with Texas and she decides that she's gonna move to Denver, Colorado in 1915. And this, <laughs> once a freaking again, she meets and marries a salesman. His name is Richard Pete. She's like Cordelia. Remember Cordelia in that other episode I talked about? Not long ago, Cordelia. Louise is kind of similar to her. She has like beer flavored nipples or something. I don't know. People just freaking fall for her. <laughs> wild. Anyway, so they get married, these two, they get married and they go on and they have a daughter named Frances Ann. They call her Betty for short. And this happens about a year after they meet. So like clockwork, Louise, she seems to struggle with married life, which leads to the couple to be constantly fighting, disagreeing about stuff. And then four years later in 1920, uh, the two decide it's best to separate. So they do. Louise seems to only have about a four year threshold of people and places because she then leaves her husband and daughter. And then she moves to Los Angeles, California. I don't know how she's doing it. I really don't. Okay, great. So she moves to Los Angeles. Wow. And guess what? You probably guessed right. She meets a guy named Jacob Denton, who was like a recent widower and he had a teenage daughter. Leaving her own daughter to be a mother to someone else's child, it didn't seem to be Louise's cup of tea, you know? She's like, damn it, no. But it turns out Jacob is also a mining engineer who made millions before he retired. So she's like, meh, I'll give it a whirl. You know, she's like, whatever. She just sees dollar signs. Their meet cute love story starts when Louise inquires about a 14 room mansion she is hoping to rent. And uh, what she wants a 14 room mansion for, we may never know, but she does. And Jacob, the guy, uh, he's the one who's renting it. And he's asking $350 a month to rent his 14 bedroom mansion. And Louise is able to sweet talk him all the way down to $75 a month. First of all, $350 a month for a 14 room mansion in Los Angeles, a tragedy on its own. What the hell? Cannot even come close to relating Louise. $350 for a 14 room mansion? I know that was a lot to them back then, but still. Anyways, so Louise sweet talks him. She gets him down to $75, great. Louise moves in on May 26. And then um, she and Jacob start hooking up. It wasn't long until uh, Louise, she proposes marriage to Jacob, but he turns her down saying that he was going out of town for a month and like, it just wasn't gonna work out wasn't in his schedule. And when Louise hears this, she is quite upset. I mean, she always gets her way. I mean, nobody has told her no so far, you know? So she's just really unsure what to do with these new emotions. No, huh, you know? So now during this time, rumors are circulating around town as to what role Louise plays in uh, Jacob's life. Is she really his living girlfriend? Like Louise claims she is? Is she the housekeeper? Is she the tenant? She never signed a lease, so who is she? You know, people are just talking, gossiping, trying to figure out who this lady was living in this big old mansion and where she came from. Well, a couple days after Louise's proposal, Jacob just poof, vanishes, disappears, gone. Now he was supposed to go out of town for a month, but no one can confirm if he did indeed actually go. So Louise tells uh, the neighbors that, oh yeah, he went away for the month. Yes, yes, I saw him off. Don't worry, like he's just gone for business. Calm down, girl. And like, don't worry about it because they were kind of asking like, where is he? It's been a while. And then some time goes on, things carry on, but you know, people deep down are having that funny feeling that something's not right with Louise. Hmm. So a few days later, Louise hires a gardener to come out to the house and spruce it up, spruce it up a bit, you know? So she brings a gardener in and she's like, hey, can you come into the house and unload a bunch of dirt into the basement of the house? Now the gardener is like, 
um, that's a very odd request. What exactly is the dirt for in the basement? You know, and Louise tells him that she's planning on growing Jacob's favorite kind of mushrooms down there as a surprise. So when he comes home, he's going to be like, oh my God, mushrooms, my house, just what I always wanted, you know, super strange, but she has money and these gardeners are here to work. So it's like, meh, sure, we'll do it. Makes enough sense. So they load in a bunch of dirt into the basement and she's going to grow some mushrooms, I guess. Then on June 5th, Louise shows up to the local bank with a permission slip from Jacob to withdraw $300 from his bank account, and it's also giving her access to his safety deposit box. Now, the bank teller noticed that Jacob's signature, it looked a little suspicious. It didn't look so right, you know? So she's kind of like, oh, this is off. Let me say something. So she points it out to Louise, like, you know, the signature doesn't, girl, it's fake, you know? And Louise, is, uh, she just gives the teller some crazy story about how she had to help Jacob write his signature with his left hand because his right arm had to be amputated after he got in an argument with a mysterious and very angry, quote, Spanish looking woman who shot him. Super believable, super believable. She's like, yeah, that's what happened. This is a real story. That's what's even better about this whole nonsense. And the teller, I don't know, I guess she's like, oh wow, that must have, like that does happen, I hear. And she gives Louise access to the money and the safety deposit box. <laughs> she gets away with everything. But Louise seems to be having a hard time keeping her story straight. Maybe she just doesn't give a rat's ass, I don't really know, but she retells the story again when she comes back to the bank at a later time. But this time saying that the woman cut off his arm and his leg, but this time with a sword. Very dramatic situation. She then said that Jacob was so embarrassed by his amputated arm, not the leg though, but just the arm, that he had locked himself up in the house and will only speak to her and her only. So as the weeks go by, Jacob's friends, neighbors, and business associates, they start worrying and they're questioning Louise a bit. They're pushing a little bit harder. They're like, where's Jacob? We haven't seen him, meow, meow, meow. And Louise, she just always had an answer. She would tell him like, oh, his business trip got extended. I'm sure he'll be back soon. Like, don't worry about him. He's totally okay. Depending on who was asking, her story would change. Sometimes he lost an arm, sometimes he didn't. It just, whatever. You know, she's free balling it. I think I'm using that term correctly, free balling it. I think I went a little crazy with the blush. <laughs> you would think I don't know how to do makeup today. You really would. Anyway, while Jacob was out of town, air quotes, Louise seemed to be quite happy running the show. She was spending his money, driving his Cadillac, renting out the rooms in his mansion, and just in turn, she was pocketing the rent money, smart. I'll give her that. She bought two very expensive dresses at a local high-end department store under Jacob's name while claiming to be his wife. She also pawned a bunch of his jewelry and more valuable possessions. I mean, she is doing the most. And she wasn't worried about a damn thing. She was like doing it so confidently and very openly. There was no secret, you know? This girl's bold. I think cause she knows she could just pick up and leave again. She's not worried about it. Well, Louise found out, Louise found out that Jacob had some rental properties out in Phoenix, Arizona, and she's able to contact the tenants and she convinces them to start making their rent checks out to her instead of Jacob. Wow, you know? She was really doing it. She was, she was a professional scammer. Okay, so you know how I mentioned earlier that Jacob had a teenage daughter? Okay, well, if you don't remember, look, he had a teenage daughter. And while all of this was happening, Louise running around stealing money and just being a shitty person, Jacob's daughter knows something is up with this shady woman. Now, Jacob's daughter, she was living with Louise in the house, but my guess is that it's a 14 bedroom mansion. So like you probably really don't have to interact with one another if your house is that big. That's what I'm imagining, right? She's probably like on the left wing and you're on the right wing and you never really see each other unless you have to. So that's why I'm thinking she wasn't like so concerned with the daughter. I don't know. I'm really guessing. But eventually the daughter really starts to question Louise. I mean, her father has been missing or gone for far too long by this point. So she's like, you know what? I'm not getting any straight answers from this Louise woman. Let me hire a lawyer in hopes to help find my father. So a lawyer comes out and questions Louise, like, you know, 
where's Jacob? And she just kind of blows him off saying that she really just doesn't know. He's on a business trip, but whatever. But she does agree to give the lawyer uh, Jacob's financial and business documents as soon as she can. It might be a few days until she can gather that information, but she'll hand that over to make sure there wasn't any unusual activity going on, you know? Hopefully track where he's at. She's like, yeah, I'll get that right over. At this point, Louise had rented out every room in the mansion and she decides this is her cue to go. Okay, she's like, well, my time has expired here. And she packs up her stuff and she ends up going back to Denver, Colorado. What Louise does is she goes crying back to her ex-husband, Richard, the one that's taking care of the baby. Yeah, she goes crying back to him, like, take me back. I wanna be a family again. I miss you, which is so messed up. And Richard is like, dude, I just been taking care of our daughter for the last four months and trying to figure it out. And now you just wanna come waltzing right back back in. Okay. So, you know, she's a good talker or something. And she's like, okay, let's, you can come back, you know, let's be a family again. She wants to be a wife now. But back at the Los Angeles mansion, now that Louise is gone, Jacob's daughter, she decides that she is going to search the house up and down and search for any type of clues, just anything. Okay, evidence, something that will help her figure out what the heck just happened. So the daughter is searching the house and on September 23rd, 1920, she finds Jacob's or her father's decomposing body. He's tied up in like a number of cords. He's wrapped up in blankets and he's buried in the basement. Mm-hmm. But he's buried like in the basement under some stairs. I couldn't figure out if it was like in the dirt. Maybe the dirt was preventing people from going down there. Cause he wasn't necessarily in the dirt. He was under the stairs from my understanding. Either way, he was dead. Okay, so the autopsy report determined that Jacob was shot in the head and strangled. So Louise is obviously their number one suspect. So the police try and track her down. They go out to Denver to question her. So they knock, knock on Louise's door and they're asking her, hey, did you have anything to do with Jacob's death? And she has a number of theories as what might have happened to him. One of them involved the mysterious Spanish woman who shot Jacob, causing his arm to be amputated. It must have been her. But no one was buying that theory anymore because Jacob's body still had his arms and his legs attached. So, no. And then Louise tries to change her story again, this time claiming that Jacob isn't dead at all, that the body they found inside the mansion, oh nay, nay, that was not him. That was a double who Jacob had killed himself. She's like playing Clue or something, I don't know. She thinks this is a murder mystery dinner. Now, at first when I was researching this, I was like, let me guess, they believed her, right? Because like everyone seems to believe her. Anyway, so police are like, what do you mean double? Like, what do you mean? Does he have a twin or a lookalike or something? And Louise, she had no answer for that specific question of theirs. So with that being said, they placed her under arrest for first degree murder and dragged her ass back to LA. Now here's where you probably think that the story is gonna end. No, it does not. It goes on and on and on. It goes on and on and on. But okay, so Louise, she does get arrested and she is, she does get put on trial for the murder of Jacob Denton, which starts in January of 1921. And it was the hot gossip at the time. There was thousands of people lining up on the daily to watch Louise walk into the courthouse and like see what she looked like and what she was wearing and stuff. Cause they were interested. They were super interested. Newspapers were reporting on this trial and they were selling like crazy. So the media was loving it because it was selling newspapers. There was just something about Louise that had many people captivated. Anyhow, so um, the trial, it would only last for a few weeks. And then in February of 1921, Louise, she was convicted of first degree murder and she was sentenced to life in prison. Now, great, beautiful, we love that. She deserves it, but there's more to the story, okay? Let me do my lip liner really quick. So during her trial and her first two years of her life sentence, Louise's husband, remember him, Richard? He stayed super loyal and supportive. He pretty much was the only one who believed that she was innocent. I mean, she wasn't, but she believed that she was. Louise, she told him straight up, listen, you should move on, okay? I've been convicted of murder. You can be free to divorce me and remarry. Like find yourself a nice woman. You deserve it. This is what she's telling Richard. And now this was heartbreaking to him, but he agreed and he was like, fine, I'll get a divorce, but 
he tells Louise that he was gonna wait forever for her because he knew one day she's probably gonna get released and then they could be together again. There was just no other woman out there for him. And Louise is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna lose it, bud. Now something super strange happens. Let me tell you, because the as soon as the two of them divorced, Louise, she stopped answering Richard's letters and she refused to see him when he came to visit her at prison. Well, first of all, Louise claimed that poor Richard felt so guilty over her conviction and the fact that they're not together that he committed suicide. I was trying to figure this one out because we know that Luis didn't do it because she was in jail. Great, right? So my thought was like, maybe she put someone up to it, but like, why would she, you know? I was like, well, maybe he did commit suicide, but what are the odds that every freaking ex of yours commit suicide. Like, what is this? You know, this lady is deadly. They are dropping. I don't get it. I just, I don't know, but maybe he did. And then I feel bad because I'm like, yeah. Okay, so Louise, she's using this to her advantage. She's telling others in jail that no man can resist her charm. And she's just kind of using this to brag about it. All of their husband's deaths, I guess. I guess maybe people are impressed by it. I don't really know. Well, get this. So Louise started her sentence at San Quentin State Prison before being transferred to like a women's institution. In California, it wasn't far, but she's there for a while and she plays the role of like this perfect prisoner. She's like, oh my God. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. And like using her Southern charm to make those around her just think she's such a splendid little lady. She maintained the prison's flower garden. She worked as a dental assistant and even wrote for the prison newspaper. Now she would end up serving 18 years before Louise was paroled for good behavior in 1939. Yeah, she's paroled for good behavior at the age of 59. So she gets out. Okay, so there was this woman named Jessie Marcy. She was like lobbying for Louise, Louise, Louise's release. When Louise was released, wow, she would go into Jessie's custody. But the deal was that Louise was going to be Jessie's live-in housekeeper, okay? I don't know the connection between the two, but it doesn't matter because get this. It's like a sweet deal, but Jessie ends up dying of natural causes, like not even a week after Louise is released. I think she's aquatofauna ing everyone's ass. She has to be. How is she doing this? Natural causes? Where? Either she is killing them or people just are dropping like flies around her. I mean, that's not a coincidence. Come on. Louise then, she moves in with her probation officer. Her name is Emily. So Emily takes her in and Louise was like, okay, I'll work as your housekeeper and also as your nurse and take care of her because she's a little bit older. So this arrangement, it didn't last long because Emily died of a freaking heart attack in 1943. I mean, come on. Why is everyone who comes in contact with this woman just dropping dead? It's so bizarre. For some reason, police never looked further into these deaths. Like since they died of natural causes, there wasn't much to look into, but it's also because, this is the, the thought here, that the local police, they didn't look into Louise's like past or Louise at all because they had no idea that she was on parole in the first place because when she was released from prison, Louise changed her name to Anna Lee. Yeah, she changed her name to Anna Lee. Lordy, lordy, lordy. Louise just has everything all figured out. She's one step ahead. So. After Emily died, Louise found another living arrangement for herself. This time it was with an old prison friend named Margaret and her husband, Arthur Logan. Now, Margaret and Louise were good friends and she always thought Louise was innocent in the first place. Margaret did. She thought Louise was innocent, just the sweetest little lady. So when she heard that she was in trouble, she wanted to help her out. So she invites Louise to come live with her. She was like, hey, if you move in with me, can you be my live-in housekeeper in trade, you know? But also, if she could be a nurse to Arthur who was suffering from dementia. So she's like, can you be his nurse? I'm sure you can imagine where this is gonna go. But as we have learned, something is off with this woman and Louise starts telling neighbors these rumors. She's like, hey, Arthur, yeah, he goes into terrible fits of rage and he beats his wife, Margaret, every night. She's telling everyone this and she's telling them this rumor and I don't know why, well, it'll make sense later, but she's telling everyone this and they're like, oh my God, like that sounds so awful. And Luis is telling the neighbors like, don't, don't mention it to them or uh, Margaret because like, it'll just really upset them. <sighs> so they're believing it. They're like, oh my gosh, poor Margaret is just in an abusive relationship. Okay, so once again, in June of 1944, Margaret disappears. Nobody has seen her. Nobody has any clue where she, she went. 
Nothing. Three days after Margaret goes missing, Louise decides to put Arthur in a state hospital. Oh yeah, she wheels him right off to the state hospital. I think this woman is the actual devil. Louise moves herself full time into the house. My house now. I cannot believe her. So of course the neighbors are asking what happened to the Margaret and Arthur. And Louise is telling them like, oh my God, you guys. Arthur attacked Margaret, bit off her nose, and she's so disfigured that she's like too embarrassed to come outside. Mm -hmm. That's what she tells them. The cycle continues. But okay, look, right before Margaret went missing, Louise had met a new guy. He's a banker, his name was Lee, and she met him and they went on to get married. You know how she does it. So she left out that tiny detail about being in jail for murder though. So he really had no idea. Plus he thought her name was Anna. So they've been dating, Margaret goes missing and Lee had met Margaret once before and he's asking Louise like, hey, what happened to Margaret? Like it's been a while, where's she been? You know, just asking, just genuinely asking. So Louise repeats the same story that she's been feeding to the neighbors, but adds that after the attack, Margaret went into isolation and in preparation for plastic surgery on her nose. Now it's weird because Lee and Louise are actually living inside of Margaret and Arthur's home for about six months. And he doesn't further wonder like what the hell is going on? Where is Margaret? Like he doesn't know or question or I don't, now it's believed that he didn't question anything like what was going on because Louise was forging checks and spending Margaret and Arthur's money on herself and her new hubby Lee. Like you want anything? I'll buy it for you. So maybe that's why he didn't care too much and didn't keep asking. I, I don't know, but that's what it's believed to be true. So the spending spree is cut short when Arthur dies in December of 1944. And the bank notices that there are still checks being cashed with his forged signature. And that doesn't make sense because Arthur passed away. Hmm. So how is a dead guy signing checks, right? So the bank teller calls up the police who naturally head over to where Margaret and Arthur's house, where Louise and Lee are living and they're investigating. They're just doing their questioning. They're like, hey, you know, we got to call, you're forging some checks, whatever. And they're just getting a funny feeling about the couple, but no arrest was made. I think Louise was telling the police it must be Margaret, but Margaret's out of town. So the police was like, okay, we'll come back in a couple of weeks when Margaret is back and we'll talk to her. So the police come back a couple of weeks later to further ask questions and maybe even speak to Margaret at this point. But Margaret's been missing for six months. So they ask Louise, like, okay, you know what? Can we just look around the house? You know, this is just weird. Like what is really going on here? So they're looking around the house and in the backyard, they discover a shallow grave. It's under an avocado tree. And in the shallow grave is Margaret's decomposing body. Louise is immediately arrested. This time only taking a couple of hours for Louise to be charged with murder again. So the autopsy report determined that Margaret had been shot in the back of the neck and she also had a fractured skull. So during questioning, Louise tells police that Margaret was actually attacked and shot to death by her husband, Arthur, during one of his anger fits of rage and that she had been telling the neighbors about it. And if they didn't believe her, they should go ask the neighbors because they knew all about Arthur's abuse. Honestly, I'll give her a point there because that's kind of smart. That's kind of smart. I'll give her that. She's literally thinking ahead. You don't see that too often with most killers, like this much, you know? So Louise admits to police that in a panic, she had buried Margaret and didn't report the incident because she was afraid that they would charge her with murder because of her previous convictions. Or, you know, because maybe she murdered her, but she insisted she was innocent. She did not kill her. So Louise's husband, Lee, he was also arrested and charged with murder. And like his wife, he also insisted that he was innocent. The murder charge against him was dropped because there wasn't enough evidence. So Lee was released, but his freedom was short lived because guess what happens? The very next day, Lee jumps to his death off the ninth floor of an office building in Los Angeles. You guys, 
This is too strange because I don't know. I don't know if people are just off in themselves. I'm not trying to be funny, but I, if that's the case or if they are being killed by Luis, but Luis seemed to be with, in police custody. So maybe he did, I don't know. I just don't understand how this is happening. I really don't. Like, are they killing themselves or are they being killed? I wanna say that they're being killed, but I don't know. Anyway, so for the first time, Luis actually shows some emotion when she learns about her new husband's death and she openly cries and she tells reporters the media, that she felt she was the one to blame for Lee's death. That's because you are. I wonder if there's like some life insurance she's collecting on these guys or what the deal really was because again, this is just bizarre. So Louise's third and final murder trial begins on April 23rd, 1945. It gets some media attention, but nobody really cares as much as they did as like the first time. So the prosecution believed that Louise killed Margaret in order to gain control over the Logan family finances, which makes the most sense. The prosecution thought that Louise got in an argument. There must've been an argument between her and Margaret after she discovered a check that Louise had forged, which then led to her killing Margaret. That's what they believe happened. And it must've been a very compelling argument because on May 31st, the jury found Louise guilty of first degree murder, again. But this time, Louise received the death penalty. Okay, not life in prison. This time, she was gonna be put down. No more of her shenanigans. Now it was said during her sentencing, Louise sat calmly reading a book of Chinese philosophy called The Importance of Living. And she only looked up once to make some kind of mocking facial expression before going back to her, her uh, cell. So over the next several years, Louise attempted to appeal several times. She maintained that she was innocent, but each appeal failed. Her day of execution finally arrived, April 11th, 1948, exactly eight years after she walked out from the women's prison the first time. This lady has way too many coincidences going on in her life, huh? Anyways, Louise tells like, you know, her friends in the jail or whatever that she's ready. She's ready to go. And she calmly like walks from her cell to the gas chamber. And it was said she was smiling and she's like, yay, I don't know, yay. And everyone's just watching her as she's entering the room. Now she had a really big crowd of people watching her. Like one of the most ever, I forget how many it was, like 80, I wanna say 80 people were watching her be put down which is very unusual. As the guards left the chamber, one of them offered a final farewell saying, goodbye, good luck, breathe deep and don't fight the gas, thanks. And at 10.03 a.m., the deadly gas pellets dropped and 10 minutes later, Luis was declared dead. She was the second woman in the state of California to be executed. Honestly, good. She caused way too much chaos, my God, oh my God. And that, my friends, is the story of Louise. I don't even know what her name is because she changed it. What was her name? Louise P? I don't even know. Louise P, great. So this story, it totally sounds fake. It totally does, but it's a real story. She was, I don't wanna call her crazy, but she was crazy. Something was off. I don't even have any words because it was like, good. There's no place for her. I'm sorry, girl. Like you had many chances. Oh, a lot of chances and you chose violence over and over and over again. Goodbye. I'm not a big fan of the death penalty, but in cases like this, it totally makes sense. You know, like she literally proved that she doesn't want to change. Anyways, I would love to hear your guys' thoughts down below. I kind of love these older stories because the women back then seemed to be real different, real unique, <laughs> passionate passionate killers, I must say. But I would love to hear your guys' thoughts down below. I think I like this makeup look. It's cute. It's my hair I'm not liking. I hate my hair. I'm having a very bad hair day. I don't know what to do with it. Anyways, thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. I appreciate you so much for hanging out with me here and you know, just being a friend. I really appreciate you. Especially if you made it this far into the video at the very end, you're a real one. I appreciate you. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your week. You make good choices. Please be safe out there. Let me know down below in the comment section what you or who you want me to talk about next week. I love you guys and I'll be seeing you later. Bye.